and uh, he has a very interesting statement. He says that uh, uh, religion must be separated from the state, but not from politics. <laughs> and uh, to do this, we have to exert more effort in, separate, in, in defining what could be politics and what could be the state. And I think that it, it is an excellent idea to separate the, the state from the church. The church as a political body that has an authority, that has the final say, but I don't believe we, we have ever to separate Christianity or Islam or Judaism from the public life. It's even impossible. It's impossible in America, it's, it's impossible in France, it's impossible everywhere. It never happened. It's an idea that never happened, never materialized. I mean, give me one example that when you go to, into the public life, you stop being a religious person, you turn into a secular person that stops speaking about religion. It's impossible, it's in your motivation, it's in your idea, it's, it's in you, you as a person. And, uh, and people are motivated with religion for the good or, or the bad reason. And, uh, and, and, and they behave and decide according to their religious convention. So it's better to recognize this situation because it is real. I mean, there are many religious groups in, in the United States who are involved in the politics, who choose who will be the president and what should be the policy about abortion, about this and that. So I don't find any problem in this. I don't find any problem in this, but I find the problem if the president of any country in the world would say something and then the, the bishop will say, no, your decision is cancelled. Why? Because I'm a bishop and you are just a president. This is very unacceptable. So, uh, I, I, I think first that in Judaism it's impossible to separate uh, the religions from, from the state because many, many of the religious uh, commandments and guidance are how to run a state. Exactly, yes. this is, uh, so it's part of the religion. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, originally there were four, four uh, sources of authority in, in the, and I think it's still considered like that in the ideal uh, Jewish state or, yeah. Uh, so there, there was the king who had the political, uh, who was the political source of authority. And there was the, uh, the prophet, who was the spiritual source of authority. And there was the, um, the judge, who was the judicial uh, source of uh, authority. And there was the, the priest, who yes. was the worship uh, source of uh, authority. And, and they, all, they, all, they all should be balanced. And each of them has his own role and uh, his own uh, weight and he's more uh, determining in his own so you can be the king and you probably in many things you can do more than anyone else yes but you are not allowed to enter the holy of holies yes because you are a king you're not the priest yeah and the priest he, he can enter the holy of holies but he does not decide whether to go to war or not yes. and so on and, and none of them decides about uh, a specific uh, court case it doesn't matter how strong it is and the, and the king can be brought to the to the court if if he did something wrong yes so they are they are in balance and of course the prophet can criticize all of them yes and uh, and there's this balance between them and all of them are, are are bound by the torah so all of them are supposed to be sincere and do uh, the right th make the, the the utmost effort to do the right thing of course in history it didn't always happen but it's not like I, I think that uh, the issue of separation of church and state is more crucial in in Christianity because Christianity is, as far as I know at least does not have a, a clear set of rules uh, about how to run a, a country how to run a, an economy how to run an army how to run a social system uh, etc so uh, when there was not se no separation, it means that the the, the religious authority, by the, like like you said, by the fact that it was a religious authority, uh, instead of being one citizens on on that level, used or misused his religious power to to have a, a higher w or more weight to his opinion, yes. and this was wrong because he he, he did not. Uh, he was not in the role of the political leader. Yes. But in the Jewish context, context the, the religious leader himself 
is supposed to be a servant of God. And it's, it's supposed to be ruling in the way that is guided by God and serving God. Should, should we wait to see? Uh, do you need to pray? Uh, no, but just uh, for the sound, the voice. Uh, we can wait a minute, but uh, actually it gave a lot of flavor to the, oh, really? to the discussion so to we, have we this in the background. It's quite okay. nice. Um, we'll be able to, to work it out. I think you meant in your last statement, didn't you, the political leader is supposed to have, Yes. Uh, you said religious leader, and so I just, you might make your last sentence, change your last sentence, because you, you said... You said the religious leader should be uh, serving God. Oh, no, I meant the political leader. Yes, yeah, so yeah. if you wouldn't mind, just pretend you, we're going to, we'll edit that out, say it again. Just say it, look at him and just say, no, okay, it's, okay, the, it's the, exactly the political the leader. Okay, so <laughs> no, but, but the, the idea is that the, the political leader himself is a servant of God yes. and is supposed to do his utmost to, uh, to behave in a way that is guided by the Torah and is serving God. So yeah. his political decisions should be part of this process. Uh, you know, like everyone has his role and this is his role. Yes, but uh, okay, let me ask you this question. So are you happy or unhappy with the Israeli state? Yeah, I'm happy with it, but it's, uh, it's does not... It, I mean, does it observe the Torah? No. Of course, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, it, we're, talk, we're talking about processes, about everything. <laughs> everything is a process, or nearly everything. So, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the... Uh, at the early 40s and the late 40s, so ob obviously the, the Jewish nation made a, a big leap forward towards, a, I would say, independent existence, uh, self-governing, but also coming true, back to its true nature. nature. Yes. So, uh, and of course, the, the state is not, is, is not complete yet. It's still developing and it has a lot to develop. In, in, in all aspects, especially in the spiritual aspect, but that's the, it's, it, it's on the way. And uh, uh, you have just said that uh, in Judaism you, you may have different and even contradictory opinions about every issue. How the state will, uh, will behave toward this kind of pluralism? I mean, they have finally to, to pick up only one of them. And in my understanding to your statement that the state is both political and religious this kind of selection will be both political and religious. Right. So, so the, I mean, but... The what if I'm a Jew and I don't like this kind of selection, I want to choose something else? So on your personal level, you can choose whatever you like. But, I mean, you have to, I mean, the state usually have to select one as, as the... Yes. As the... I'm, I'm, a taxi, it's policy. I'm a taxi driver and one of the reform rabbis said that you can drive your taxi on Shabbat. And the state would refuse this opinion. No, the state does not, uh, at least at the moment, the state uh, does not enforce the laws of Shabbat. Yeah, but uh, you said that this is a mistake that should be corrected in the future. No, I, I, I don't know exactly how, uh, what, what does it actually mean to be uh, uh, a state that is fully governed by uh, by the religious law, by the halacha, because I mean it's not as simplistic as just taking the Shulchan Aruch and replacing the the the, the national uh, code of law by the Shulchan Aruch. It's not like that. You have yes. to translate it in, into into practical terms. And uh, so I mean one beginning of that is the. Uh, determining Shabbat as the day of rest in the state of Israel, which is uh, already done. But on the other hand, I mean, you cannot uh, suppose we we had even now the Sanhedrin, the full, the fully authorized court, uh, and the Sanhedrin, of course, is uh, should be authorized to issue death penalties to anyone who violates Shabbat and uh, yeah. goes through the process of warning him and witnesses and all the process. Uh, still, in, in today's reality, probably it, uh, this court, even if existed, it will not practice it. Yes. Because we know that on the, on the one hand, the Torah is full with death penalties about plenty of things. But on the other hand, the Mishnah said that uh, uh, Sanhedrin that would uh, execute, ex execute a person once every, every 70 years was considered especially lethal. Uh, and also when there were too many murders, so the Sanhedrin went away from the place in the temple that, that 
yes. that uh, where it is uh, authorized to issue death penalties. Yes. So the thing is not uh, not to kill as many people as you yes, as you course. can. Yes. The idea is to keep the, the and and also I think not to to have people observe the Torah because they fear you will kill them. Yes. This is not the idea. Yes. I mean, the idea is that uh, people observe the Torah because they are personally committed and each and every one of them makes the personal commitment and every Shabbat they make again the, yeah. the choice to observe the Shabbat because, they, because they, 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 they identify with this path towards, uh, towards God. Yes. And, uh, and when there are exceptions that are especially, uh, uh, how do you say, rude, Yes. Uh, then, 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 okay. These exceptions, you execute them, and you have this measure that if uh, it happens more than once every 70 years, or, or even n not less than once every every 70 years, then uh, something is wrong in the system. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, my understanding to what you are saying is that the state itself is developing, yes. and that it is going in the right direction, and it is covering more and more. Every day. Oh, no, I don't say that, that I can. It doesn't. It doesn't cover any parts of the uh, religious halakha. Yeah, it cover parts. It covers, yes. Like the family no, laws. I, I didn't say that it's developing and every day is better than yeah. the previous day. No, <laughs> I didn't. Say, I couldn't say that. It's not that uh, continuously, but it is developing. Yes. And it, things like the family laws, for instance. Yes. Yeah, but right now you know that the conservative and the reformed Jews cannot marry in Israel. They have to travel to Cyprus to get married and come back again. No, they, they, Are you happy with this? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know about the details of that, but I do know that, I mean, that doesn't matter. I mean, you know, according to the Halakha, you don't need a rabbi to get married. Yeah. You need two witnesses and, and to follow the procedures. Yeah, but this is a case in which the state started to behave religiously no, no, and politically and selecting one opinion, that's the orthodox. Yeah, but I mean, no. And in the same moment, no. some people who are not secular, they are religious, but they happen not to be from the same school that the, that the state selected, cannot get married. So, let me go back to, okay. <laughs> to the answer. Okay. Uh, according to the, to, the, to, the, to the halakha, you have to follow the procedure. Doesn't, you don't need a rabbi at all to get married. Yes. Every two people, like described in Islam, every two people can... Uh, uh, he gives her a ring, she accepts the ring, two witnesses, finish, they are married. You don't need a rabbi, you don't need anything. You don't need rings. Just the word, do you marry me? Yes. No, in Judaism you have to, to exchange yeah. uh, something. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. And, and, and uh, yeah, so this, is, so this is the procedure. It doesn't matter who is the rabbi. Now, the state wants to, uh, uh, to organize it, and, uh, and it gave the authority. There are nine different courts in, in Israel. There's yes. the, the Jewish court, the Druze court, the Muslim court, and uh, six Christian courts. And, uh, and they are authorized to register, um, to register marriages and divorces. Yes. Okay, so they de develop their own procedures. Some of them are, uh, are halachic, some are not. And the, the main role of the rabbi in the, uh, in the marriage ceremony is to make sure that everything follows the procedure. He's not the, I mean, it's not like in Christianity. He's not making the marriage at all. He's yes. just, in some, in some cases, yes. one of the witnesses. In other cases, he's just you know, supervising the process. Yes. Uh, when you come to ask yourself which rabbi should be the rabbi who does that, and the situation in Israel is that uh, 99 point a lot percent are orthodox, yes. and even the non-religious are considered orthodox rabbis as, as, as the rabbis, I, I don't see a reason why, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, there's no, not that, I, I mean, I don't see a real question. Yes. Okay, so I don't know, like, uh, a few th hundreds, maybe thousands of people that are uh, non-Orthodox and are religious, and they can uh, they can get married with uh, with an Orthodox rabbi, and it will not be very different from the yes. conservative rabbi in terms of the procedure. Yeah. And if it is very different, and it, if it doesn't fit, uh, uh, if the uh, reform procedure does not fit the halakha, then they are not married anyway, regardless of who is the rabbi witnessing it. Yes. Um, Okay, let me speak about Islam now. Okay. And uh, I would say that when you, you say that uh, someone has religious authority, we should define what do you mean by authority. 
it's like a physician's authority. It's like surgeon's authority. Exactly. It's like a, it's an expert this is in his field. Yes. Yeah, it's not someone who is speaking on behalf of God. No, it's not someone who is uh, telling us the truth. It's not. No, it's not like this. No. This case happened when Muhammad was still living, uh -huh. but the Muslims were 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 conscious enough with the fact that he is still a human being, and in in, in many occasions, people, he would say, "Do this." And people will ask him, uh, excuse me, are you asking us to do this thing as a prophet? Is it something that was revealed to you by God? Or is it just your opinion and your wisdom? So he says, no, this is my wisdom, this is my opinion. So he says, okay, this is the wrong decision. <laughs> we shouldn't do this. It, it will make us fail in the war. It will make us fail in agriculture. It's many occasions. So it was very clear that sometimes he behaves as a political leader, sometimes he behaves just as a prophet. The second thing I, I, I want to say is that I always think that the problem is in the modern state. Ultimately, there is no ever possible way to have this modern state applying Sharia or Halakha and still preserving the nature of Halakha and Sharia as pluralized. It's difficult. And I decided to shift the blame, not on Sharia and Halakha, and try to manipulate them so that they fit in the modern state, but ask the modern state to change itself. Please stop being that hegemonic, that you control every couple wants to get married, that they should be officially registered in your papers. Stop doing like this. Stop having one law for every community in the society, because you have many communities. And I see that the future is going to change the state not the religions and not the halakha. And do you know what's the best example? It's in the business world. When I and you decide to have a company, and we will have our company in Egypt or in Tunisia, whatever. It's many multinational companies right now. And then we decide that, okay, let's, 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 let's apply the Cypriot law. Okay, you, you say yes, so we can choose our law. And then, you know what? We will ask Randy to be the one who will solve our problems. Whenever we have a problem, Randy will be the judge. And these kind of judgments are officially recognized by states now because they support business. Yeah. They're not interested in religion, but they are, they are interested in business, and especially in, in the international investment in their lands. So I think that the future will be in reconstruction of the modern state itself. This kind of hegemonic, huge state that controls you, that if you are poor, this is must be officially registered, or you were not poor. Yes. Otherwise, you are not poor. And if this is the name in, in the papers, then this is your name. You cannot change your name, unless they know first. You cannot do anything in your life. You cannot go to the school, you cannot go to the army. You cannot do anything in your life unless it is officially registered, manipulated, regulated, by regulations, bureaucracy, and law. And this situation is wrong. I, th I think in a, in a way it is changing in Israel. Uh, people usually criticize it, but uh, the civil society is taking more and more roles that yes. previously were taken by by the, the government. State. Yes, and and it's it's because uh, the state is weak and ineffective and inefficient and corrupt and things yes. like that. But the end result is that uh, the state is doing less. Yes, the people are doing more. Yes, and in the education also, you find that uh, it's a phenomenon now that new education systems are emerging in the same country. Yes, with different curricula, and yeah. this is not something that you would say frequently in the 60s. Yes. Also, also I would say that, uh, at least I say about the Interfaith Encounter Association, yes. I think it's, it, it's embedded in, in, in the interfaith work in general, yeah. that uh, there, is a, there is a saying there that don't wait for the government to make peace. Yes. I mean, take, take your own steps and do yes. whatever you can and contribute your own share yes. to make another step. Yes. And, 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 and make sure that it's a real step that takes things even, even in a small way, but yes. forward. Yes. And don't wait for the government to do that. Yes. It's good news. Yes. <laughs> that was a very interesting exchange that you had there on, uh, I think a lot of people will find what you discussed uh, clear, stimulating, and controversial and therefore uh, good cinema. <laughs> uh, and I will go to the next so question. we can sell commercials <laughs> with a uh, higher value. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do we want to do next? Uh, here's one of my favorite questions. 
I can, can I have some water? And oh, sure. It's time to take a break. Yeah. Let's take a break. Okay. <laughs> Pour yourself a glass of water. We'll let the film. I'll stop. You don't worry. Take, just take a break for a minute. Go to the bathroom, whatever. We can get, let it run because I've got six hours of film here. No, no, we won't keep you for six hours. <laughs> I was fascinated personally by your comments on the, on the decentralization of social order. Um, right now, I am involved in a group in the United States that is working on the question of marriage, the one you were bringing up actually here in terms of secular sacred. Um, it has to do with, of course, homosexual or same-sex marriage. But the, the, the real question is the same. And my position on this is, um, I don't think it's unlike what I heard you say. I think the government, for the benefit of taxation and protection of children, and perhaps protection of spouses in the event of a, of a separation, has some civil non-religious, but civil obligation that's good for society to protect children and spouses. Therefore, I think there ought to be a civil union. Yes. Just a, uh, a, like you guys see it, not a sacred union, yes. but a civil union that the government ought to give um, sanction to. Then I think there ought to be, for whatever your value system is, for whatever your religion is, a separate um, if you want to have a separate ceremony to give more meaning to what you've done, you say that now we have a sacred union here or a contract union. Or, and so my vision for pluralistic society would be not are you, are you married, but what kind of marriage yes. do you have? It's a more interesting question. Yes. You know, you get into depth on you know, how, what do you see marriage as instead of just, oh, it's marriage. Well, it's not just marriage, and I think the pluralism in our societies is making very clear it's not the same for everybody. So let's let's reflect that reality and let, let's get the government up to date with the religions. <laughs> and and so I, I find that compelling uh, that you said the same for that that could work actually in Islamic society. Um, let's um, I'm going to read this question and then we'll put it on tape. But it's a little long, and so I, I want to make sure we have it understood before we go into it. You want another drink? Thirsty. Okay. <clears throat> if God has the power to communicate truth to mankind, why doesn't God make the same truth clear and obvious to everyone in every place in all periods of time? God might not force everyone to follow the true path, but why doesn't God at least give everyone the same true map? Do you understand that question? Yes. I'd like you to. I'll, I'll repeat it on the, uh, when you want to talk about it, then. You need to go to the bathroom or anything? You want to sit down and talk? All right, let's get back to work. I'll repeat the question just for the benefit of the. Put it up as high as you can. Put it there. That's better. That's good. All right, gentlemen, thank you for that. Uh, stimulating discussion. Let's go to the next question. If God has the power to communicate truth to mankind, why doesn't God make the same truth clear and obvious to everyone in every place in all periods of time? God might not force everyone to follow the true path, but why doesn't God at least give everyone the same true map? So basically, you ask why, why not everyone is a prophet? <laughs> and uh, the Jewish answer for that is that since the destruction of the temple, there is no prophecy, yes. at least no, not among Jews. So, uh, so we, we are now in a different phase of the human existence when we don't have a prophecy and we have to rely on the prophecies that we have written and are recorded in the Bible. And, uh, and uh, I mean, what you are saying is that uh, during the time of the temple, the truth 
was revealed to the uh, Israelite prophets. During the time of the temple, uh, everyone could train themselves to be prophets. Yeah. And it is said that there were prophets twice the number of the people who went out of Egypt. So if, if, if you say you talk only about the men who went out of yeah. Egypt, and twice the number, it will mean a million and two, 200,000 people. So yeah. uh, many, many prophets were there, yeah. but only a few of them were recorded because yeah. the if a, if a person has his own experience of hearing the message of God and the message of God has to do with his own life, it's yes. not interesting for all, all the people in all the generations. Only those 48 people who had messages that, uh, that are there for many centuries and for many, many other people yes. were recorded in the, in the Bible. Yeah, but, uh, but then I have two questions. One of them is, are you saying that 1,200,000 uh, Jewish prophets had a consensus among them about everything because they were revealed the, the truth? No. No. No, because I mean there were different people. They, they had different challenges. They had different paths. So, of so, life. That so there were things that they were they agreed upon, but it has. I mean, they, they all followed the halakha. Okay. So the question is, uh, uh, does God reveal the truth differently? Uh, I think you have to say yes, because the, the prophecy, like any other thing, is very personal. So every person receives the messages that he needs to, or, he sh or she needs to hear. Yeah. And some of them are messages that also others need to hear, so they are recorded in the Bible. But the vast majority of them had messages for themselves. Maybe there was the message for the wife, so they told her too. Yes. But. Uh, and yes, so and, and also there's the difference between um, uh, the prophecy of Moses and all other prophecies, mm. because all other prophecies were very personal, mm. and the personalities of the prophets, okay, so they were very pure, mm. so they were already prophets, but they were not fully pure. Mm. So the metaphor that is used is that, is that um, um, the uh, the message that they got was like looking, uh, seeing an, an image through a mirror that is not totally clean. Yes. Okay. The only, uh, the only mess, the only one who got the message through a mirror that was, was Moses. M m fully clean was Moses. Yes. So he was the only one who was able to see how the big divine message uh, translates into the tiny details of the halakha. Yes. So the only person that existed that could derive halakhic conclusions from his prophecy was Moses. Yes. Any other prophet who tries to derive halakhic conclusions from his prophecy should be killed. Yes. It's not only, you know, not a nice <laughs> thing to do. It's, a, yes. it's very, very wrong. Yes. Uh, because you get the messages for yourself and you have to make sure, you, yes. uh, that you do not deviate, not only not deviate from the halakha, yes. but also not, you know, not make a, a decision, an halakhic decision based on your prophecy. Yes. The prophecy is a general guidance. It yes. cannot give you the details because it's, you're not there. Yeah, it's very interesting. I will come to this point again and compare it with Islam. But, uh, but first I have my second question, which is, and why didn't God reveal this truth to other nations, to other peoples in he India did. and China? And he did. I mean, there's, uh, for example, there's a, uh, I mean, the most, the strongest, I think, way of saying it is that uh, when the, the Torah said that there was no prophet like Moses yes. uh, uh, in, in the nation of Israel, inside the nation of Israel, the commentary said, but there was one outside the nation of Israel. Yes. And, and he was a very bad person, Bilam. But they said that the level of his prophecy was parallel to the prophecy of, uh, of Moses. So definitely the, uh, prophecy is possible for non-Jews. Yes. And it depending only on the, and there's even a, one, uh, one source that I remember that says it explicitly, that uh, I testify heaven and earth that every person, regardless of their status, can be, he can be a slave, a, child, uh, Jew, non-Jew, and any, any, any person, according to his deeds, he gets the divine uh, revelation. Yes. 
And, uh, and these kind of messages just disappeared in history? They were not recorded, they were personal, I guess. Yeah. Okay, in the, I mean... I mean but the, I mean, if you want to ask whether it is possible from the Jewish perspective that Muhammad was a prophet, it is possible. Okay, and I mean, in Islam we have the same answer that uh, the God sent prophets everywhere, but uh, this is the space of my doubts. I, I don't find these kind of messages that look like monotheistic traditions everywhere. I don't find it in China, I don't find it in India, and I always ask why, why God uh, decided to reveal his message only in this specific region in the world. It's su such a very small area in the world. And I, I mean, it's a question that I keep thinking about. I, I, I like your answers, but I, I, I still keep thinking about it. Um, my, my other answer is that relates to your question about the minor prophets, if we can call them minor prophets, is that in Islam it's very clear that prophecy is something like Muhammad. You, you get the message, you get something to the people. You have a message from God and you have to send it to people. However, revelation itself continues till now. And also someone like uh, Ibn al-Qaim, who is a medieval scholar, he says that every, exactly your statement that he says that every person on earth will have some revelation from God in one way or the other. And he says that there are degrees of revelations and that uh, the highest one of them is to see God directly. Second one is to speak with God like Moses. And there are other kinds like you have a vision, this is a kind of revelation. However, we have two paths in Islam. One of them is mystic, this is the Sufis, who will celebrate this kind of personal revelation, will celebrate it very much. And the other kind, or the other path is the juristes. The juristes could not deny this kind of revelation. They cannot deny it. But they say that, okay, you, there, you go to your revelation, good for you, don't tell anyone. Don't make any decision based on this kind of revelation. It's up to you. And there is a famous fatwa that someone asks the school, we have in our tradition that if you saw Prophet Muhammad himself in your vision, that means he is Prophet Muhammad because this is the Satan doesn't expose himself as a Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So you see him. So someone says that I am a judge. I slept the last night and I had a vision and I saw Prophet Muhammad and he told me that this guy has the right of this land and that this land doesn't belong to the other guy. What should I do next day in the court? So the scholar said, you do and you take your decisions according to the physical evidences, not according to your visions. Because if everyone will follow his vision, it will be a messy situation. How can you prove it? How can you, mm -hmm. you disapprove it? So and I, we had an earlier discussion about the truth and reality. And I told you that usually in, in the legal system and in, in the Islamic tradition, there is favor of the notion of reality over the notion of the truth. That the truth matters less. What matters more is the reality, is the legal reality of the situation. On the other hand, I, when I, 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 I heard from Randy the, the question for the first time, I said, well, this is a question for God. You are asking why God did this and he didn't do that. You, you have to ask him because he is the only one who can answer this question. I mean, I, I can't explain something that he did. But I mean to... What did he do? Oh, they didn't do. I mean. <coughs> but to comment on what you said, I mean, there are, there are different levels of uh, revelation. Yes. And, and also different levels of prophecy. Yes. Uh, but let's say from up to a certain level, it's not prophecy. Yes. Okay, there are different relations, different um, yes. ways of messages from, from God or from the divine reality. Yeah. But only from a certain level up, it's prophecy. Yes. And this level does not exist. And, uh, and when, when the, the temple was destroyed, the first temple, yes. because the second temple was not, already, was not complete, so yes. it, didn't have, uh, it, it, uh, it could not produce new prophets. Yes. Uh, so after, after the first temple was destroyed, there's no way to get prophecy, regardless of your personal qualities. And yes. the Talmud says about some people, this guy was, was, uh, had the personal uh, uh, degree that he should have been a prophet like Moses, but because of his generation, he did not uh, yeah. uh, get it. Yeah. 
Well, in Islam, mm -hmm. you, you can't be trained to be a prophet. But you can. Uh, you cannot. I cannot. You I cannot be no. trained to be a prophet. But uh, it's a, I mean, it's a matter of God's selection and choice that uh -huh. he chooses this person to be a prophet. But uh, this kind of grading, the prophecy itself, it exists in Islam that uh, they, they try to distinguish between two uh, cases. One of them is the Ar-Rasul and an nabi Ar-Rasul is a messenger, an nabi is a prophet. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they use the two definitions in each other's places. So someone give you this definition to the messenger, they yeah. say, no, 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 this is definition to be to the... But anyway, the, the two stasis are, one of them, he had a revelation very strong from God. The second one, it's not only a revelation, it's also a message to the people mm -hmm. that he has to carry this message and deliver to the people. Yeah. So, so I think it, it sounds like parallels uh, yeah. to the prophets that have only personal message and yes. prophets who have messages. Father, but yes. the, the Bible clearly records uh, the the reality of uh, schools of prophets. Yes. I think uh, if I could interject here, uh, a, a parallel question, um, and. I think it's probably uh, also, I, I have a hunch what your answer will be, but I think it'll be interesting to have you address it. There is, of course, within the Jewish tradition, the idea of a chosen people. Would you speak to what the calling of the chosen people is in the world today and uh, what special um, unique aspect Judaism brings to the world that Islam does not, that Christianity does not, that Buddhism does not. Um, what is unique and special about the call to be the chosen people in your mind? Um, how should I stop? So, uh, the idea of the chosen people is that uh, the nation of Israel was chosen to be leading uh, humanity on its journey towards God, to become closer to God, to follow the path of God, and to make the, the world uh, divine. Leading or be an ideal? Both. Because leading has a, a role, a political role. Yes, yes. But leading on, on, on the spiritual sense, not necessarily... It's like a missionary think. work, like... Something like that. Yeah, spreading the word. Uh, but also, also as uh, an example, the, the yeah. metaphor that is used by the, by the Torah is that the nation of Israel is a nation of priests. Yes. So like the priests in, uh, inside the, the nation of Israel that are responsible for the worship, for, for the, the worship of God, for all, all this aspect of life, the spiritual aspect, then, in the same way, the Jewish nation are responsible for, for that, for the whole of humanity. So they should be leading uh, that, teaching the rest of humanity how to do that. So the idea is that the nation of Israel got, uh, as a result of this chosenness, a very detailed prescri prescription of how to do that. Mm -hmm. And they all have very detail about every detail in life. They have the guidance how how to live it in a divine way, uh, or in a way that is m in accordance with the will of God. And, uh, uh, and they should first become uh, a, an example that, uh, that it is possible to run a whole nation in a divine way. So it's not, uh, being divine is not something for very special people who will go to monasteries, uh, live uh, like holy people, grow long beards and, uh, and grow long hair and never wash, or, or, or whatever the model you want to choose, but it, it's not for very special people. Mm. Every person and the whole society, and uh, it's, it's uh, the priesthood and the political leadership and the army and, and the beggars and, uh, and the merchants, and every, every person can be part of a system that is guided by the divine. So first, the, the idea is to build such an example, and then to, to lead others to follow that example. The, the others that will follow this example will not adopt uh, the Torah as it is, because the Torah is the detailed prescription for the Jewish nation. But other nations are other nations. They need a slightly or greatly different prescriptions. 
So what we have for the other nations is, uh, first of all, we, we have the, the framework of the seven commandments of Noah that set the, the framework. And the seventh of them is that they need to, to complete the, the, the details for themselves with the guidance of the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is like uh, the, uh, the general understanding of, of this idea. When you use the word nation of Israel, do you mean the political uh, existence of something that started in 1948? Or? No, of course not. I mean, I mean the, the, uh, the, the existence that started, the, actually it is 1948, but 1948 for the Jewish count, which is around 4,000 years ago with the, with the birth of Abraham. And, uh, and that started this, uh, develop, the development of this, uh, okay, it was started with one person, but the, but the development of the nation that eventually got the, the Torah in Sinai and started getting used to it and starting building itself. And then it didn't work so well, so we went on exile and then uh, uh, we believed that we will come back and start building it again. Uh, but uh, yeah, and we already maybe started in 1948. You can say that we started before with the, the waves of immigration back to the land of Israel. But uh, uh, but we are in the process. I cannot say that you know. Look at Israel today, and you have the uh, the, the answer to all all the world's problems. But I I hope that if we look a uh, hundred years from now, or I don't know how long from now. We will have a state of Israel that will be an example that the whole world will follow. This is, this is the idea. Otherwise, we are failing again. Uh, is it necessary that this happen through a state? Or is there a way of influencing the leadership of the world through a, a dispersion of, of, of the Jewish nation in all countries? I think it has to have happened through, its, through a state. I mean, how can, you, how can you show the world that you can run an economy uh, that is guided by God when you don't run an economy? How can you show the world that you can run a, an army that is guided by God when, when you don't have an army? That's a, that's a, to me, that's an enlightening statement because I though I'm not part of this dialogue, uh, I come at this from a, a, the Christian point of view where there's the idea of proselytizing, changing the hearts and minds of people in their own countries, and therefore, through those principles, they will change their economies. Yes. They, they, they will act in love and you know, in, in peace and all that respect, and so that they will actually change the economies of their own countries in a Christian, quote unquote, way mm -hmm once they have been converted through the process um, of, you might say, spiritual regeneration. Mm -hmm. With respect to Islam, um, how do you see Islam leading the world to a better place? What is the, if you will, are Muslims a chosen people? Is there any, any uh, competition between the Muslim chosen and the Hebrew chosen or the uh, Jewish chosen? And if so, what's your story? What, what is the story of, of the specialness of Islam in the world? Um, well, uh, I mean, the, the concept of competition exists in the Quran, but it, uh, it is a competition between the believers to do the, the, the best things that God wants. And it's uh, but when I think of Islam and its uh, leading role in, in the world, I, maybe this is my personal opinion. Maybe, maybe this is not a statement as uh, someone who is representative of my religion, but uh, I'm less concerned about this, about uh, uh, an international leading role of Islam. And I'm more concerned about the individual level, that you as an in individual, you should represent humanity in the best way possible ever. To be a good person, to be compassionate about people, to be cooperative, to be helpful. And, uh, and when your life ends, of course you will make many mistakes, but it will be a very good thing that the good you did will overcome these many mistakes. And, and I, 
I don't know. I'm, I'm not very much. Uh, maybe this is a very personal thing, but I'm not very much concerned about fixing the world. I'm more concerned about uh, one moment, the moment that I will stand before my God, and He will ask me directly, personally, very, very directly. I created you. I gave you health. Gave you knowledge, education, parents, friends, so and so. So, what did you do? You lived 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. What did you do? And I, and I have to give answers. You have to say, okay, I did this good thing. I, I, I tried to make my, my son a better person, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. I, I did this and I did that. And it's, I'm very concerned about my answers, that what kind of answers I will give to God in this moment of, of finally meeting him, which is the most, I mean, this is the greatest moment that I think of. Second, from this my moment comes my concerns about the world. Not about fixing the world that I'm really interested in fixing the world, but I will, I will help the people who fix the world because I'm interested in answering the question. It's not about the world itself. It's about this moment of being, of being asked and you have to have the right questions, the right answers. And there, there is a very interesting hadith that the Prophet said, if this is the last moment of the world and the qiyamah, that see, the end of the world is coming, it, it is coming, that the world is ending, that God is coming, that there will be no more heavens and earth and everything is, is vanishing before your eye. And you have a plant in your hand. What do you have to do? Plant it. Put it in earth as soon as possible. And here, the emphasis is not on, I mean, how long <laughs> this plant, what kind of chances this plant have to, to be a big tree and to bring fruit so that people can eat from it? It, ha it has no chance. But this is not the question. It doesn't matter if this plant will live, if it will not live, if the world will be better, if it will be worse. What matters is that at every moment you are doing the right thing. You are trying to make this world a better place to live in. Not because you're interested in the world, but you're interested in answering the question of God. That I tried as possible as I can, as honest as I can, to make this world a better place. And I'm also, maybe again, this is a very personal statement that uh, maybe I'm the least one who is interested to show that the Muslims will have the bigger role ever in fixing the world. I'm, I'm really not interested in this. It's, I, 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 don't, I don't even understand the significance of, of this role. I, but I like that every Muslim will help everyone in the world to make this world a better world. If, if those people are Christians, are Jews, are Buddhists, and I mean, in the other world, God will account them. Right now, we have almost the one work to do, to make this, this world, this life, a better one. My motivation is this moment to, when I will meet him. You have a different motivation. There is a secular person who doesn't believe in anything of this. But still, he shares me the same concerns about this world. Okay, I'm happy with him. I'm, I'm, and, and in this kind of work, it's, uh, I'm really not interested at all to, to show that the Muslims are the best ones. Who, I mean, it, it looks even silly. It's like, do you know the, the big donors who give you the money because they need their name on your letters? And if you want to do something good, why, why do you need your name to be mentioned everywhere? It doesn't matter. I, I, I don't think we do it to show anyone anything. I mean, th this, is, this, is the, this is our mission. No, 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 I'm not yeah. comparing it to yeah, Judaism. Yeah. I'm just answering his question. No, but yeah. In Judaism, it's a, it's a different case because yeah. you have chosen people. And it's a, it's a kind of mission that God chose Israel. And yes. God made Israel a nation of priests. Mm -hmm. And you have this function. I mean, it's not yeah. something that you, you decided to have it or not to yeah. have it. And, I, and also, I think, I mean, I, I fully agree with you in the sense that, uh, uh, of course, I need to first, first and foremost take care of myself. Yes. I, can, I cannot neglect myself <laughs> and say, no, no, I'm, I'm fixing the world. Because then the world will not be fixed. Yes. There's one of the Hasidic. Uh, uh, teachers who said that uh, when I was young, I thought I, will, I can fix the whole world. Yes. Then I grew up, I said, okay, I, do, I will not fix the whole world, maybe, maybe I will fix my country. <laughs> then I grew up more and I said, okay, maybe I will fix my, my town. 
Then I grew up, I said, okay, maybe I will fix my family. Now I'm not sure I can even fix myself. <laughs> and, but if I started the other way around, I, I had much more chances to fix even the whole world. So of course you have to start from yourself. Yes. Um, and also I, I want to say that I think also for the way I understand it, uh, I think it's, a, I mean, it's, it's not a direct answer to your question, but I think it is an important statement that from, from the way I understand it from a Jewish perspective, Islam, uh, is participating in this process of fixing the world. And is, um, I mean, uh, since uh, a Muslim who follows Islam is uh, a perfect or nearly perfect uh, Noachite, that, and, and nearly perfect is quite good. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then, okay, so these people are, are, are uh, fulfilling the Jewish message for the fixing of the, of the world. Yes. So. I also want to balance my answer just to remind you that I made a personal statement, but in the Quran, it's not like you are the chosen people, but it says that you are witnesses. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's a, maybe it's a different, but it's a very interesting word, that you are witnesses. Witnesses of what? Yes. That you are witnesses that you are witnesses of the truth, that you say that the right thing is you have to do this. We shouldn't have this. We should do this. We should do that. Mm -hmm. And um, in the Islamic scholarship, most scholars will say that uh, we have to be ideals, that everyone should represent in, in, in his morality, in his behavior with the other people, the, the best example of humanity. And this is the best thing you, you can do to, to your religion. Um, a kind of collective mission of Islam to lead the, the world, again, I'm. I'm not into this. It's it's very good thing. Many people are doing it already. I'm happy. I encourage them. But uh, I'm not a part of it. Uh, when you said your Hasidic uh, story, I remembered another Sufi story, uh, and the one who told me this story is uh, one of my professors, Vincent Cornell. He said that there was a Sufi sheikh on a ship, and they were in the middle of the ocean, and there were like high waves and. Uh, Everyone realized that everyone will go will going to to drown very soon. So those people are doing this, and those people are removing this, and everyone is trying to handle the situation. And what the sheikh is doing, he's putting his pot and trying to fix his lunch, just heating his lunch. And 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 because of the, the ship is not balanced, the his lunch sometimes comes to this side and to this side. So he is praying that his lunch will be saved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they say that, uh, hey, if you are a Sufi Sheikh and God listens to you, at least pray for all of us, not for your lunch. <laughs> but uh, what's the meaning of this? If his lunch is saved, the entire ship will be saved because this is the only way that the ship will be balanced. So that if you, if you are concerned with your own business and you do it very faithfully, inshallah, the entire world will be fixed because this is again the, the it's the work of God. No, but the thing is that uh, according to Judaism, I think also according to Islam, it's, it's not enough that you live your personal life yeah. uh, gu guided by God as a spiritual person, uh, follow the commandments. You have, you have also public, uh, not, all, uh, not everyone, but some people have public roles. Yes. And they, live to live, they need to live not only their personal lives, but, but also their public roles yes. in the same way. Yes. And these people have the responsibility to shape the society yes. in a way that is guided by God and, and bring it, it closer to God. Yes. So you can say, okay, I'm not interested in leadership positions, yes. but uh, I mean, even if you write academic papers, yes. you have the responsibility to to write them in, in, a, yes. in a sincere way yes. in a, and so yeah. on. Yeah, I totally agree with you. What, uh, what is Dawah? Could you define Dawah? that? Yeah. Um, in the beginning of Islam, Dawah, maybe it had many definitions, but finally it became a kind of missionary work. But again, everyone, everyone will immediately, if you mention the word missionary, will say, no, it's not a missionary work. Okay, it's not a missionary work, but it's, a, it's, like, it's more like spreading the word and less like converting people. It's not like, it's, yeah, so it's, it's more like teaching. It's like uh, telling people about Islam. And uh, the, one of the most interesting ideas right now is that why jihad um, 
is, is not obligatory in, in this time? The answer is because of the internet. Because jihad was obligatory to spread the word. The word could not be spread to the Roman Empire or to the Persian Empire because of the emperors, because of the empire, the political system itself. But once you have internet, you don't need to fight anyone. <laughs> the word is already spreading by emails. <laughs> So email is the new jihad. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, there is a resistance in, in uh, what you've just said to the idea of trying to convert. Yes. Um, what is the difference between being a witness yes. that is persuasive yes. and sincerely persuasive witness and someone who's trying to convert? Another, another way of saying this is some of my associates say, Missionary work is the equivalent of cultural genocide. Yes. Others say missionary work is the highest act of love and care that exists. Yes. Speak to that question. Yeah. I mean, isn't there a, a desire that uh, all people will be Muslims, or at least, let's say, I don't know about the Jews and Christians, but at least all others will become Muslims? I mean, later in Islam, not in its beginning, if you look into the history when the Arabs invaded uh, Egypt and uh, the North Africa, there was less interest in spreading Islam. It's, but there was an interest in letting people know about Islam. Mm. It's just that let people know. And you feel that you have the duty of letting people know about Islam. And many people are very much provoked by people like Bin Laden and all of those people and they say that they hijacked Islam because what people know now about Islam is horrible. And they say that the one thing we, we want to do as, as this is our individual mission is to let people know about Islam, about what they think of as real Islam. But to convert people, first, I, I, I don't believe this is a part of Islam that you exert work to convert people to your religion. You have to tell them about, the, you deliver the message, but you don't convert them. Second, and uh, maybe not expectedly, I, I don't feel any problem with, uh, with religions that have uh, so much concern about the missionary work. I mean, I don't have any problem with the Christian missionaries, for instance, and I, I totally understand and maybe sympathize with their cause. And I don't think of it as a cultural genocide or something. And I, I see it as very logical. If you, if you have a mission, if you have a, a religion that tells you this is the truth, and this is the only way you can be saved, if you're really compassionate about me, you have to tell me to please come with me so that you can be saved. And if you have this message, if you have this conviction, this belief, and you ignore me totally, this is almost insulting. It's like you don't care about me. You have to, to let me know. But finally, I'll, t I'll make my decision. But I mean, I'm not offended by someone who is trying to convert me. It's, uh, it's expected. I, I always understand it as uh, coming from compassion, from caring, from love. That's it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a bit annoying. Uh, the way it is done, but uh, yeah, but um, the concept itself, you're right. I mean, yes, using, I mean, using money in missionary work is is not a, a very good thing. Using using the needs of the people to pressure them directly or indirectly is not a good thing. But the basic idea that you spread the word, that you care about the other people, and you want you want them to join your tradition, it's okay. Again, my and my special understanding of Islam is that. This is very, uh, I mean, it's not a typical thing to, to be said about Islam, but my own understanding is that as long as you honestly believe in whatever you believe in, I hope that God will, will accept all of us finally. And I, so, I mean, it's, it will be a different situation in the other world. This is God himself. And uh, he made us Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Buddhists, and Hindus. And uh, my expectation, could be right or could be wrong, that he will finally accept all of us. It doesn't mean that I say that I can be any one of them. No, I have my choice. And I believe in my choice, and I, I will follow my path. But uh, in the other world, I expect God to be merciful enough to forgive all of us.
Okay. <laughs> Maybe you don't need to <laughs> to broadcast this heretical statement. <laughs> Are you saying you won't, you're going to make me cut that beautiful statement? <laughs> we'll we'll, uh, we'll let you we'll let you do it if you must. Uh, I, but uh, is it heresy, or is there a place for that within Islamic orthodoxy? There is there is a place of, for that in uh, in there is a place for that in Islam, and there is 